like to ask Pastor Stevens to come forward and Amen. preach what the Lord laid upon his heart. Thank you once more, preacher. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. It's a joy to be here, folks. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you all for inviting me out. It's been a blessing. I didn't think Koreans were this crazy. I, the ethnic thing I never quite picked up somewhere along the way. But um, It's a joy to see Brother uh, Ryman. Some other folks here. <clears throat> I appreciate Brother Ryman saying something the other night <clears throat> about the fact that... Um, Doc, I told him on his deathbed <laughs> to tell his boys that he loved him. So it's good. Let's open up here tonight, this morning, whatever time it is. <laughs> Whatever. It's time. Genesis 5. It's the next step. Genesis 5. You know what's there? <laughs> Genesis 5. This is where the 10,000 years jumps off and beyond. Because... Uh, this guy here is our guy. You know what I'm talking about yet? <laughs> Maybe y'all haven't been taught this. Did Brother Kim cover the rapture yet? <laughs> Genesis 5. Didn't get to that yet? Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Genesis 5. Go down to verse 21. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Amen. We can bow our heads there, have a word of prayer. Now, Father, uh, we've heard a lot this week already. There's more to come today. We appreciate it. I uh, neglected in saying a while ago... And thanks for um, these folks having me out and these other men out. Uh, the, all the work that's gone into this, Father, I thank you for letting me have a part in this. And uh, we come here now, and uh, this is where what's true in history ties in with what will be true in prophecy. We all have a part in it, or we all should. And I pray you might help us to see our place here today. Uh, may we not be deceived by our unworthiness, or for that matter, by an over-haughty uh, sense of um, self-esteem. I pray you would help us to see where we fit. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, once again, I uh, bring you to the remarkable uh, character, the case of Enoch. <laughs> Here's a man that never died, and he never will. Uh, translated that he should not see death, every translation in the Bible is a translation upward. Uh, unlike what the rest of the world says, anytime anything in the Bible was translated, it wound up better than it when it began. And you, you have to like that. You have to like that. Uh, he was removed before the wrath of God fell in Noah's day. Just like we'll be delivered before the wrath of God falls in the great tribulation. Uh, he was not, some have said and noted, that he was not under the law. Just like we're not under the law. Uh, some have noted that his relationship with God was based on just that relationship, not ritual. There's nothing that you do by ritual, whether it, as good as... Believers' baptism and uh, communion is, there's nothing you do by ritual that makes you right with God. Amen. And so it was with Enoch. Enoch's relationship 
was just that. It was a relationship with God. As uh, far as we know, and the Hebrews hadn't showed up yet. Eber hadn't yet showed up. So um, Enoch was neither Hebrew nor Gentile. Just like you. And just like you that are saved, he was translated that he should not, be, that he should not see death. That's our great hope. That's where we pick this off here today. Uh, there are a few things to say, I guess, to begin. Um, we know precious little of Enoch. You have three or four verses here in Genesis 5. There is one uh, verse, I believe, in uh, Luke 3. There's three or four verses in Hebrews 11, and there's a couple or three verses in, um, in Jude. But beyond, when it all adds up, there's only about eight or nine verses in the whole Bible that talk about the guy who we look back to as the guy that has our part in prophetic history. There's only seven or eight verses. We don't know what he did for vocation. He could have been a blacksmith. He could have been a farmer. Probably was not an IT guy. <laughs> Unlikely, but possible, I suppose. <laughs> we know nothing of his accomplishments. If he ever built a tower or, you know, had a cross street named for him, we don't know about it. If we know his one son's name was Methuselah, we don't know anything about his wife. And we don't know anything of the names of his children that followed Methuselah. We know nothing of a description of his personage. We don't know if he was tall or short, big or small. Um, temperament, don't have much of a sense of it. You know, the Lord doesn't major on those things like we do. If we had written the book, we would have all sorts of drama involved. And uh, all sorts of pictures and stories. And the Lord gave us the bare essentials of what we need to know. <laughs> and so there's not a lot you know about Enoch. Um, it struck me uh, a few years ago as I was reading through here that if I could just figure out a few th what, what Enoch was doing when he was translated, me and you would have a pretty good idea of what we should be doing. Amen, here as the last days are upon us. Amen, and so I was thinking about that, and you know, like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach to you this morning about what Enoch was doing with the understanding that I'm, I'm not trying to squeeze these texts and just wring something out of them. As I've said, there's only eight or nine verses involved total. But as I read and thought about it and prayed about it a little bit, I, I think I can, there's some things that can be said Amen. and some lessons to be drawn that maybe some haven't drawn, and I know that uh, Joel Osteen's crowd don't get it. <laughs> and so uh, anything that I say here that you disagree with, I just want you to understand that I'm not trying to squeeze these texts and just wrench something out of them. You can tell me if you agree with me later or not. But in Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, it says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Now that's not a lot of information. Um, we know that he had a son. His name was Methuselah. And you know, I really seriously doubt that the Lord translated Enoch as our foretype, the church, yep. and the rapture. We're going to be uh, the bride of Christ up there. I really seriously doubt that Enoch was shacking up with this girl. Yeah, I doubt so. So if that's the case, he had a son, well, then he had a wife. And we know that he had other sons and daughters as well. Well, if he had a wife, he had a mother-in-law. Well, there's some things that come with that. Usually a father-in-law, a few heartaches, her moving in with them as, they, as she gets old. <laughs> but there's other things that you see there. I mean, the marriage... As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For women married and were given in marriage, right? And uh, when you uh, 
read about the passage on Lot, you find there that he ate and drank, bought and sold, built and planted. And so it's fair to say that, say you have a, you probably have a dramatic uh, theatrical preconception about some things. It's easy to think that way. When you read that Enoch walked with God, you probably think that he spent all his days in a Franciscan monk's cape sitting on the top of some mountain with a bowl haircut on his head. <laughs> Something like that. No, the fact of the matter is uh, he had a son and wife and other sons and daughters and uh, he had a mother-in-law and a father-in-law and they, he pro his wife probably came with brothers and sisters, so brothers and sisters-in-laws and nephews and nieces and birthday parties and anniversaries and all the stuff that we do. And he still had to eat, drink, make a living, mow the grass, butcher the sheep, go kill a piece of venison once in a while. You say, what are you getting at, Brother Stevens? Well, if I could just figure out what Enoch was doing when he got translated, I might have some idea what I should be doing. And say, you're, you're all going to be down here in a few hours because this is going to wrap up. I'm not trying to put a damper on the meeting, but this will all wrap up by 6 or 7 or 8 or 2 o'clock or whatever it is <laughs> by the time we're done. And y'all are going to drag y'all's hind ends back to work tomorrow and you're going to be depressed. <laughs> Because you're going to feel like you've been to the mountaintop and now you have to go back to prison. <laughs> I would just like to remind you that when Enoch got translated, he was doing some of the same things as everybody else. Everybody has to eat, drink, make a living, pay the taxes, replace the hot water heater. Everybody's got a leaky radiator. And you just have to go through it. Yeah. Amen, brother. But that's what he was doing. He was doing some of the very same things as everybody else in the world. All flesh has to take a bath given the opportunity. Yep. All flesh has to eat. All flesh has to drink. You're going to wind up doing the, the same thing as lost people. Right. Except your end is different. Amen. And so I want to say that one of the things that I'm sure that I can, I can find in here without going to the Hebrew <laughs> that Enoch was doing is that he was doing some of the same things as everybody else. He was do doing mundane stuff. Whoever said life had to be interesting? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Whoever said life was a drama? I'm sorry you've seen so many movies that you think your life should have a soundtrack. Come on. <laughs> and you know, in the morning, and that way if I had one... When I heard the, the minor key play in the morning, I could just tuck my head back under the, the, mat, the, the pillow and just stay in bed. Because it's going to be a bad day. Do you know what a minor key is? Whatever. Is it a Korean thing? What? I'm just kidding. I shouldn't come here and insult y'all. <laughs> but Enoch was doing some of the same things as everybody else. All the monotonous daily tasks. Plunge the toilet. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And from there he went to glory. In the translation. But that's what he was doing. Same as you. Um, he was working. Paying bills. Occupy till I come, said the Lord. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Just slog. <laughs> Through the mud of life. That's what it is. Plot along. I don't fly with the eagles very well. Some of these guys get preaching and boom, whoosh, whoosh. I'm kind of down plugging along on the ground, just plodding along. That's, that's me. That's me. But that's where I'll be raptured from. Amen. The eagle will be raptured from way up 10,000 feet, but I'll be raptured from down here with the gophers. <laughs> But that's what Enoch was doing. He was doing the same thing as everybody else, largely. Amen. I'd like to say something further, verse 22. Like I said, I'm not trying to wring something from texts that are, isn't there. But verse 22, Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 
300 years and begets sons and daughters. Seems like an interesting statement. It said, if you will note, he walked with God 300 years after he begat Methuselah. What about before? He lived 365 years. He didn't beget Methuselah for 65. I'm not going to disparage Enoch. I don't know. Uh, I, like I said, I'm not trying to read something in, but it doesn't say that he walked with God before. Yes. It said that he walked with God 300 years after he beget Methuselah. Now, I don't know. Um, maybe I'm seeing things in his life that wasn't there. But I know that in life down here, sometimes a major watershed happens in life. It may, be a, it may be marrying the right woman. It may be having your first kid. It may be having a Down syndrome kid. It may be a visit to the ER. It may be a visit to the uh, funeral home. But a lot of times... Those watershed moments are an open door for God to do something. Amen. And things aren't the same after that. Amen. So what are you saying? Well, I'm saying if, if Enoch did walk with God before he had Methuselah for the first 65 years of his life, that's not what it says. But if he did, I know an awful lot of folks that didn't walk with God until a certain crisis came. And uh, since the crisis came, they've been growing. Now I want to say that I think that there's, I'll, I'll commit to it. I'll just say, I think Enoch was growing. I think the, you know, it's hidden in there a little bit, but I think it's possible that Enoch didn't grow much and didn't walk with the Lord until after he had Methuselah. Because of what the text said. And so that means that he was growing. That means that he was progressing. You say, well, I think you're reading too much into it. Well, maybe I am, but are you growing? Now that the subject's been broached, <laughs> are you growing? Because I didn't grow for my first... 10 years of my Christian life. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't grow an inch. Are you growing? I know there's lots of people in this room that are growing. I know there is. I know a lot of folks are watching this that are growing. I know that's why you're watching. But you know how sinners are. You'll grow in areas you want to grow in and you'll resist in areas you don't want to grow in. <laughs> are you growing? Because I know this, that when uh, Enoch was translated... He'd grown. I can say this as well. Look at verse 23. It says there in verse 23, And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Well, I didn't figure out 365 times 360 or 365. That would have been too much math. My doctorate is in theology, not math. <laughs> But I know this, it, it's interesting that it phrases it that way. All the days of Enoch were 365 years. A year is made up of days. And Enoch only had so many. There's no indication he knew how many. I know you don't know how many. How many you'll live before you die or how many are left before the Lord comes. You know what he was doing? He was uh, living out his days. 365 years worth of days. Now, you know what? A man, to make the math easy, a uh, guy lives to be 100 years old times 365, that's 36,500 days that a 100-year-old man uh, lives from his birth to his death. Now, that sounds like a lot of days for a 14-year-old. <laughs> But I'm 58. And that means I'm still young and vibrant, by the way. Yes, oh yes, hallelujah. But it also means that I probably crossed the peak and I'm headed down the shady side. Right? 
You know, you only have so many days. That tells me a little something that he was living out his days. And it looks to me like uh, he did some things that were worthwhile with his time. You say, what? Doesn't talk about the buildings he built. It talks about the walk that he walked. Amen. He walked with God. You've been told it a jillion times. It's a cliche now. God is the most important thing in your life. What the old preacher said. Your walk with God, your <laughs> fellowship with God is the most important thing that you have. And the Bible says that Enoch... Uh, lived out those days, all the days of 365 years, he lived out his days. He uh, redeemed the time. You redeeming yours? Got the goggles on? Sword fighting with the goggles? That's a good use of your time. That's good. Now, I know I'm an old guy, and a bunch of y'all are millennials, and so I know, I know what you thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got a cell phone. I have an iPad. I have a desktop. I have a laptop. I use them all the time. You can't let them run away with you. You can't. I'd like to say further, verse 24, it's real simple stuff here. Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Well, Enoch walked with God. What was he doing? Obvious. He's walking with God. Now, you know, I've heard preachers preach a multi-sermon series on walking with God. A lot of good stuff's involved. Um, I like the preaching. Sometimes I think it's overcomplicated, though. Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, with me for just, just a second. Keep your yeah. finger back in Genesis. Go all the way, if you will, over to Amos chapter 3. I know you probably know the verse. That's fine. But Amos chapter 3. Amos 3.3. 3. It's probably been cited this uh, week already anyway. Can two walk together except they be agreed? He was walking with God. You know what he did? He agreed with God. Do you agree? Really simple stuff. Do you agree? You know, he walked with God. Well, we walk by faith and not by sight. You say, what have you seen, Brother Stevens? I ain't seen nothing. I haven't seen a specter. I haven't seen a ghost. I haven't seen by way of apostolic means and miracles. There's just, there's just a bunch of stuff. I ain't seen nothing. I'm walking by faith. Yeah. It's interesting we think of Enoch walking with God and we think of Enoch like Adam who apparently walked with God through the garden side by side when it says that Noah walked with God and it says that Enoch walked with God. We have a tendency, we have a tendency to, to dramatize that. And uh, you don't know what that looked like. Because right. right. if Enoch's a type of the church, he may have walked with God just like you do. Yeah, that's right. Which is yeah, that's seeing nothing. Yeah, that's right. Having the word yeah. and going from there. Amen. There is no evidence. Show me the evidence where God showed up on Noah's uh, work site and put on a hard hat and uh, walked, walked Noah around with his hand on his shoulder. It's not there. It's not there. He gave him the pattern and says, here's how to do it. So go do it. And was God present with him? Yes. But was there a manifestation? Was what, did Noah know he was walking with God? Did Enoch know he was walking with God? That's good, brother. Now I'm going to come back to this a little bit more, I think, in just a minute. So, but just put it on the back burner for now. But he was walking with God. You know, there's something else that I could say. Uh, he was used 
in a way that he could never have anticipated. By that I mean, here we are. Brother, it's 2019. In fact, next month is 2020. You realize that this scenario with Enoch occurred 4,500 years ago. What do we have in common with somebody 4,500 years ago? Well, that's where history ties in with prophecy. He's the only guy that never died and never will. And we're the people that have a chance to get out of here and never die. Ever. Ever, ever. And, uh, you know, I'm, I wonder if Enoch might have walked by faith and in the dark enough that maybe when it was time for the Lord to rapture him out and translate him, I wonder if he might have even had the thought, I sure didn't accomplish very much in my life. Isn't that how you feel? But he was used in a way that he could never have anticipated because here we are all those generations later. And Enoch's our guy. I mean, Moses is not our guy. Elijah's not our guy. We're not looking for Moses and Elijah to come back. Not us. Enoch's our guy. Because, I mean, he never died, never will. And neither are we. If we get out of here to translation, get out of here to rapture. So what's the point? Well, we always think of Enoch being that way. I, I wonder sometimes if Enoch thought he was a nothing. And, you know, maybe he didn't even understand fully why the Lord was pulling him out when the Lord finally blew the trumpet or called his name or whatever. And he might have left this thing and said, well... Boy, I accomplished one big fat zero in my life. Yeah, except for the fact that he walked with God. I'd like to say further, let me take you over to Hebrews chapter 11 real fast. Like I said, there's only about seven or eight verses, maybe nine, where you can even draw uh, detailed information about Enoch's life and you have to kind of look between the lines just a little bit for some of it I suppose and so without going too far with it do the best we can but Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 go down to verse 5 by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had uh, this testimony that he pleased God. All right. Um, tell me what... Yeah, have you ever read the Bible through and you're reading through and it's very familiar words and then all of a sudden you stop and go, what does that mean? Yeah. Like I said, there's not many books like that, really. Amen. So tell me what it means. By faith, Enoch was translated. I know what Enoch was translated means. What does it mean when it says, by faith Enoch was translated? Uh, let me expand just a second. In verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Okay, God told us how He framed it. We believe how He framed it. And because we believe what He said, we understand how He framed it. It can't be proven. But he framed it that way because he said so. Amen. And we understand it by faith. It's our faith. Amen. The evolutionists have their faith. Right. We have our faith. Amen. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith. God told Abel what to offer, either through his father or directly to himself. And by God, uh, Abel took God's word by faith and obeyed by faith. But it was Abel's faith. Go on down to verse um, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, built an ark. 
by faith Noah. God told Noah what to build and gave him the pattern for building it and Noah built it. At God's word, by faith he did it. Right? So by faith Enoch was translated. In light of those other verses, what does that mean? That means that God told Enoch what he was going to do. It wasn't God that had faith that translated Enoch. By faith Enoch was translated. I think that God told Enoch what he was going to do. Hey Enoch, I'm going to translate you. I'm going to instantaneously change your mortal to immortal. You're corruptible to incorruptible. You believe that? You really going to do that, Lord? Yeah. Has it ever been done before, Lord? No. You believe me? Yeah. Yeah. See, I tell you what I think is being pointed out here is that he believed anything God said. He believed whatever God said. Here's, it, you know, we always, we always talk about Abraham, right? Here's an old man, his flesh is dead, his wife's womb is dead, and God says, guess what's going to come out of your loins? Go count the stars. Say, you believe me? Eh. <laughs> I'm 100. She's 90. You say so. Yeah. You know who I rank right up there is uh, Joseph. Poor old Joseph. Jesus' stepfather. He's engaged to this girl. One day she winds up pregnant. And uh, he's debating what to do because he's a good fella. And uh, the angel of the Lord comes to him that night. And, uh, you know, never before in the history of the world <laughs> has a guy and a gal been engaged and she shows up pregnant and there not be a man involved. So... Joseph's natural process of thinking is perfectly legitimate. If we were engaged and it's not me, then it's somebody else. <laughs> you, know, you have to think linearly sometimes. And so that's what Joseph's thinking. The Lord comes to him and says, it wasn't somebody else. It's me. You know that passage over there that says a virgin shall conceive? Y'all are it. And uh, so y'all are the uh, sole couple in all of human history that's going to have a baby without a man being involved. No matter what you saw in Star Wars. <laughs> know what I'm saying? Know what I mean, Jelly Bean? <laughs> Say, what are you saying? Joseph says, you did that? You, you, you're the father? Yeah. You believe me? Yeah. Sure. You said it. It's good with me. And so here's Enoch. And uh, if I read this right, it doesn't make sense any other way. The uh, Lord told him what he was going to do. He said, you believe me? He said, yeah, I believe you. Amen. You know what he believed? He believed something crazy. Completely off the wall nuts. You know what you believe? You believe you're going to be sucked up in the sky. Instantaneously changed physically. And emotionally. And uh, mentally. I hope mentally for some of you. You believe that. You believe some crazy stuff. And our answer? Well, the book says it. We yeah, believe there's a hell burning hot underneath our feet. <laughs> That's what the book says. Yeah. You believe God created the heavens and the earth, yeah. then destroyed it, and then recreated it in seven days. That's what the book says. Yeah. Amen. I'm just saying that one of the things that you should be doing when he comes back is believe every word he says. Yeah. And you have that foundation laid early on. I esteem all his precepts concerning all things Amen. to be right. Amen. Right? All right, I get a notice again, chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 5. This is not a three-point sermon if you hadn't figured that out yet. 
verse 5. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. I'd like to say that he was cultivating his testimony. It said that he had this testimony before he was translated that he should not see death. He was careful with his testimony. It's not a very common thing these days. Did you know you're the only author of your testimony? Well, you know, somebody said something about me. It's not true. And you know, if you just wait it out, it probably just goes away. But if you have a testimony of being a scoundrel or a liar or lazy or bitter or resentful or stingy, the chances are that you are. You know, when one guy walks up and says, hey, man, you stink. That's one thing. But when four people come up and say, hey, man, you stink. Well, maybe they're right. Some folks in church and their kid was just always into stuff. I mean, it was just bad. And, uh, they came to me one time fussing and said, well, you know, he gets accused all the time of, of you know, doing stuff that he doesn't do. And they named me off a couple times. I said, well, yeah, that's true. But the problem is, he usually is in it. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that when somebody blames him without seeing him do it, it's pretty consistent with his testimony. Yeah, right. gotcha. Amen. You are the author of your testimony. And you're now taught the, uh, the Joel Osteen crowd and that bunch evangelical mainstream Christianity. They're now telling you that God has no expectations for you. That it doesn't matter how you live. You really think that your bridegroom has no expectations for his bride? I know we're saved by grace through faith and we'll stay that way. But you really think that he has no expectations for your behavior? That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Only a moron or a flesh pot could come up with that. May I be frank? No. <laughs> um, he was cultivating his testimony. I don't know if the Lord bore witness to his testimony in some um, miraculous way or not, but I know this. I know he walked with God 300 years. Consistency counts for something. I am willing to uh, die in Minneapolis if the Lord keeps me in Minneapolis. I've been there 32 years already. Amen, brother. There's certainly nothing wrong with moving if you're called to go somewhere else whenever the Lord calls, and you should. But a long-standing testimony of standing for what's right wow, and what's good, good. Wow. is a good thing. It's a powerful yes. thing. I don't know if the Lord bore witness in a different way than that or not. I know that for 300 years, Enoch was consistent. For 300 years, he walked with God and had a testimony. Yeah, yeah. How you doing? As Brother Militello would say, how you doing? How you doing? Look down in 11.5 one more time. I, you'd notice there uh, in verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So when he got raptured, he was pleasing God. Amen. Do you know how? He was already saved. Do you know how to please God after you're saved? Okay, I'm going to give you real quick stuff because we have to go on. Okay, real fast. You're in Hebrews? Fine. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You please Him by faith. You please Him by believing anything that comes out of His mouth. That's right, brother. All right? 
Now Hebrews 13, while we're at it, I'm not going to, this is preaching itself, but it, I, I can't do it this morning. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 13, verse 16. Hebrews 13 and verse 16. But to do good and communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. How about just good old down home doing good? We're not do-gooders to get saved, but we're do-gooders after we are, or should be. How about communication? I'm not talking about talking to your wife, and I'm talking about your email account. I'm talking about the way you live. Communication. Down in verse 21, it says something else along this line. This is just a real swift run through with this. Verse 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, work in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The verse before it said, and now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. There's that good work again. There's that work of Christ working in you. Amen. He worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. How are you doing? How are you doing at a meeting like this? You know, everybody's excited. But week to week preaching, coming here Sunday and Wednesday, you're responding to what the Lord's doing. In a Bible study with 15 people here, Instead of everybody being here, the room full, everybody jacked up, sky high. Everybody's been yelling, everybody's been hollering, and then he hits your sin. And it's quiet, and there's no shouting after, and there's no meal after. And tomorrow you just get to go back to work. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of this Christian life stuff that's just not very romantic. Did you know that? And there's an awful lot of it that's just a drag. Because you still have to slop through that mud. <laughs> Pull your feet out of the swamp. <laughs> Just slogging through life. There's this. Chapter 11, verse 6. So he was pleasing to God, but there's this too now. Give me a minute to work on this, if you will. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith... It is impossible to please him. And this is still talking about Enoch. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now we've already read that Enoch walked with God. We've already preached that Enoch walked with God. That verse says there that in the context of Enoch in verse 5, Enoch must have been seeking him. Now that, like I said, you have to be careful because you've been raised on movies. Yeah. And uh, if you're not careful, everything becomes a drama play. Yeah, that's right. And so it's natural for you to impart, when you read Walking with God, you're, it's natural to impart something kind of theatrical and romantic about it. Yeah. That's right, well, that's good. Um, did you ever think that maybe the walking is actually in the seeking? It connected walking with God to Enoch. And Enoch here in chapter 11, verse 6, is seeking. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, um, I don't know about you. I pray. But it's not that often that I feel God descend upon the room and the smoke fills it and I hear choirs of angels sing. It's just not that often. In fact, the bitter fact is just about every time I get up from praying, I feel like a horrible failure. I have dozed during praying. My mind has wandered off, completely off the range during praying. And it's frustrating. 
Because man, Enoch walked with God and Noah walked with God and Dr. Ruckman, I believe, walked with God. And I read where George Mueller walked with God and Praying Hyde walked with God. These guys walked with God and Spurgeon walked with God and here I am. <laughs> except, except I'm kind of going on my preconception of what walking with God is. Did you know that Psalm 145, in fact, just go ahead and turn there real fast. Psalm 145. Psalm 145, go down to verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. Just stop right there. I call upon Him all the time. First thing I do in the morning is I put the coffee on. I don't drink the coffee. I put the coffee on. Then I go pray. Then when I'm done praying, I go get the coffee. <laughs> you say, well, maybe you should reverse that. Well, maybe I should, but... And um, I call upon Him all the time. And most mornings when I get up from praying... It's just disgraceful. Is there anybody else here like that? Well, it doesn't say he's near to them that he spoke to in prayer. It doesn't say that he's near to them when he sweeps into the room and the fog comes in and the power of God... Ah! That's not what it says. It says that he's near to them that call upon him. So if I call, he's there. Amen. If I call, I might just be walking with him. You know, people pray. They get on a bedside, broken hearted about something. And then after an hour, and their knees are hurting, and it's been two or three days already anyway that they've prayed like this, and they get up, and they're still brokenhearted, and God didn't heal them. But you know that verse in uh, Psalm 34 said, the Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart. Yes, it doesn't say that He's nigh them that He healed the broken heart, right. although I know He does that. Right. It says He's nigh to them that are of a broken heart. Yeah. If you can ever get to a point where you're broken hearted, just because he doesn't heal you don't mean you're not walking with him. I'm saying that I have my doubts that Praying Hyde and George Mueller always had a sense of God walking with them. Show me the scripture where Enoch said he knew he was walking with God. Show me the scripture where Noah knew he was walking with God. I think the walkings and the seeking. I think as long as you'll keep coming back, you're walking. I, quit crying, brother. You're making me cry. Uh, I, Doc was a real down-to-earth dude. You know that? And uh, Brother Ryman knew him better than I and was back in a kind of another, you know, older time frame than me when things first got started down there. But I don't remember Dr. Ruckman bragging about walking with God. I saw, I know that two marriages of his busted. And they went through broken, broken heartedness with the kids and fighting through battles with the devil and all those things. And I never, never heard him say, but boy was I walking with God. I think he was treading water just like the rest of us. I think that he stayed seeking him. And if you'll stay in prayer and you'll stay in church, 
And you'll stay in the Bible. Amen. And you'll keep going forward. I think there's a chance that you're walking with him. Amen. Without the sound effects. Amen. <laughs> Don't expect the soundtrack to start playing. You know, don't get the prof don't get your profile just just right so the light shines. Come on. So the double chin's not showing, you know, just <laughs> of course, yeah. Because you're seeing in the movies. Somebody's going through a hard time. And as the sun rises, they get the victory. <laughs> and you see their profile, and the music plays, and everybody's crying. Only it never happened. Amen. And it never happens. I, I think, I think, I think the walking's in the seeking. I'm almost done, so y'all just chill. Look in Jude 14. Let me go to this last passage real fast. Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, this, this, this ungodly generation of men, uh, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly men have spoken against him. What is Enoch's favorite adjective? <laughs> But it says there in verse 14 that Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. Yeah. Enoch went home prophesying. Yeah. Amen. That's what you should be doing. Amen. You say, what is prophesying? Well, it's not getting a revelation. Let me take you back to uh, Amos real fast. Uh, same chapter, Amos chapter 3. Let's cover the verse, all right? This is my favorite verse for us. And it's in Amos <laughs> on prophesying. Amos chapter 3 and verse 8. The lion hath roared, who will not fear. The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy. You know what that verse says? That says that what the Lord spoke, you speak. And that's prophesying. That's prophesying in our day. We say what God said Amen. and stand where God stood Amen. and tell folks what God told us to say. <laughs> and it doesn't vary from me to you. It's all in the book. Amen. You know, Enoch went out prophesying. It's hard to stay on the streets. I know it is. Uh, there are many, quite a few in our camp that no longer look upon street preaching as something that really should be done. There are several things that are true. First of all, it's good for me to go. But I tell you this too, it's good for them to hear it. Have you forgotten the verse, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear? Take it to them, bust them in the head. That's in the Hebrew in Ezekiel, by the way. You're to be prophesying. They're trying to shame you to dive under the couch. Yes, You're a Rachmanite. Hey. Quit flinching. This is good. Stop flinching. Amen. Doesn't matter what they say to start with. Right. They're trying to make you ashamed so you'll go undercover. Right. So you wouldn't put them under conviction. Right. You need to stay on the streets. Right. You need to stay on the doorsteps. You said... People don't get saved in Minneapolis very often on the doorsteps. And they don't get saved very often on the streets either. We are not building our church on street preaching and door knocking as far as people getting saved. We're building our church and have all the time because nobody ever has in Minneapolis that's since I've been there. We're building on the fact that God's going to honor the street preaching and the door-to-door -door visitation, and he's going to bring people in from some vector that I haven't even been able to explore because right. I've been busy doing what he told me to do. Amen. This is an unusual agricultural field we work in. You plant a seed in this field, 
but it comes up over there. And it's cool when it happens. I got to move on. Verse uh, 14 of, uh, I'm back in Jude now. Jude 14. I think he said ungodly four times there. His favorite adjective, he was standing against the ungodly. That's what he was doing, along with these other 46 things that I've mentioned. See, there's more in those eight or nine verses maybe than you thought. And there's plenty for you to do Amen. if you're going to emulate Enoch. He was standing against the ungodly. That means that, first of all, he was negative. He had a negative ministry. Yeah. Everything was ungodly. He was against it all. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was a negative Nelly from day one. Come on. For his entire generations, for 300 years, the resident negative Nelly. <laughs> But that's what he was doing when the Lord took him. And by the way, all the time that he was negative, he walked with God. I'm not talking about being negative towards your brother. I'm not talking about, I'm not going against what Brother Samson preached. I'm saying as far as this stinking world is concerned, brother, here we sit. It's 2019. This is the Silicon Valley. That's the world out there. I have one last thing to say. I'd like to say that he was looking beyond his own happiness and prosperity. Because it's more what he didn't say. I never read one word where Enoch said, I, me, or my, or mine. He was in this thing for somebody besides himself. He knew it, he was in this. He was in this thing at something bigger than himself. It's bigger than his own happiness. It's bigger than his own tranquility and his own security. Did you know that for as long as the Lord's prophesied that things would happen, that nobody's ever been ready? Prophesied of the flood, only Noah and his kids were ready. Prophesied of the Babylonian captivity for hundreds of years. And when it came, everybody's surprised. When the Messiah shows up, everybody except Simeon and Anna were surprised. Now, you get preaching and you shout and run the aisles because the rapture's next. Praise God. But are you really ready? I mean, do you, are you, is, it, is it really anticipated that Today might be the day. Wow. Now I'll tell you this. You need to emulate what we said this morning about Enoch. Because if you're doing what Enoch was doing, you're probably ready. Preacher, would you come? Let me uh, pray. Father, I thank you for an honor of the honor of being here all week. When we get a chance to say uh, thank you once again uh, to these folks, but I want to thank you as well. It's been an honor to preach. Uh, for you for these years and for this week. I pray you'd please bless as I turn this over to the preacher and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar call is open if the Lord spoke upon your heart. It's nothing dramatic. It's not where you have to shout or run the aisle. Yep. It's not something where you have to feel something. Or God has to encounter and send the rain and the lightning and some outward sign to convince you every time. It's just reading His Word. It's just praying. Believing. Seeking. Keep coming to church. That's why we stress so much about please go to a Bible-believing church. For onliners out there, please Go to a Bible-believing church. For people in here, don't quit coming. Please keep passing out the track. Please keep up your prayer life and your Bible reading. 
sometimes people feel discouraged and feel like that they have to do something big and that some of them feel like that I want to get the Holy Spirit power or get deeper into my prayer life and don't get me wrong we can learn something like that from praying Hyde and George Mueller and those people but a lot of times we feel like that there's something deeper and there's something deeper when it's God already told you simply from his word it's just by doing what you're supposed to be doing see everyday thing in life consistency consistency just Amen. keep up what you're doing Amen. just keep doing it and you'd be surprised how much it can take you a hundred miles more after that imagine man that's great like Enoch when he got raptured probably was thinking I'm not ready yet I haven't done much and but then wow he just simply did what he was supposed to do just walk with God just keep doing what he's doing you'd be surprised at the rapture how much you've accomplished for the Lord but if the rapture were to sound right now you ready that's why get back just return to your Bible reading your prayer to this church just get back about your father's business Heavenly Father thank you so much for the preaching we've heard Amen. Heavenly Father sometimes that uh, we've uh, we have relied on experiences rather than what your word says we just need to simply take it by faith those days where we serve you and sacrifice for you does not have to be something that we feel it could be those mundane everyday life and we definitely need to remember that as soon as this blood is over when we go back to our same old same old church services some pastors here will have probably only 10 members or less than 20 and some members here they're going to just come back all pumped up and then the members around them they're kind of wondering wow what got you pumped up it's the same old same old thing but Lord God we're just doing what we're supposed to do going about our Father's business. May we remember that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins I put my faith in that alone to save me not my good works in Jesus name I pray amen 
congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.